Good afternoon, students. Uh, this week we'll talk about uh, document structure and analysis, and in this video lecture we're going to uh, cover uh, PDFs. Um, later on this week I'll post some more information about other documents, um, but uh, for now we're going to focus on PDFs because they provide a, uh, a nice case study in um, exploit analysis. Uh, they have I used one in uh, the previous exercises uh, for creating the malware. Uh, and also, it is a format that is relatively easy to, uh, to read from a uh, human perspective. Um, it's not a, a binary format that requires a large number of tools uh, to get your hands dirty with. So uh, to start off with, there are um, two. Uh, standards uh, for PDFs. So there's the original, or I should say the most recent standard that Adobe defined in its products and the one that is the original uh, PDF standard that was issued in 2008. More recently, Adobe and others have updated the standard since then uh, to what they call the PDF standard 2.0. Um, all the documents that we'll work with uh, and a lot of what you will see that has been produced up to now uh, meet the original standard, which is freely available. So I can go uh, to this site, I can open it, uh, and I can go and read about the PDF file format inside of a uh, PDF. So you can see it has all sorts of information in here about uh, the different um, features and components that are inside of it. So I'm not going to go through this and you don't have to feel it necessary to read that entire document, um, but know it's there. Uh, you can use it as reference to answer questions um, or to investigate certain obscure features uh, that happen to pick your interest. So another thing that I'll, um, that I'll provide is um, I have a lecture uh, a set of lecture slides up here about container model of data files. Uh, so the way I look at it is um, all data files are containers, um, just like your hard drive, your file system is a container that contains a bunch of folders and files. Um, each one of those files contains uh, sub objects as well. So in the case of PDF, uh, your document is made up of a number of different objects you can think of say the pages that it has and the different text boxes that it has and the different images that it has are all different objects that live within the PDF document. So it's got to adhere to that kind of model or that, um, that framework. And um, that's what you'll be exploring when you're doing PDF analysis. So PDF documents have um, uh, a bunch of different features. Um, most of them are kind of obvious to you, some of them not so obvious, like uh, this one. It has some features in there for uh, 3D models. Um, so 90% you know, of the uh, users of PDF out there um, don't even know this exists in Acrobat Reader, uh, and yet it's there. And if you happen to open a PDF that uses this feature, it'll start using it. Um, so obscure features like that that are of um, wide distribution but very limited use are very popular targets for exploits um, because uh, it's code that doesn't often get tested very often and when it does get tested or used um, <clears throat> there's often a limited set of data to pull from when they're trying to uh, figure out what broke or what went wrong. So one of the things we'll start off with is um, uh, this guy Brendan uh, made, oops, made two um, posts here, I'll open them both up, um, about uh, the PDF file format and the approach that he has is really good uh, almost like walkthrough of uh, the different features uh, that are in PDF. So this walkthrough um, talks about the different components within a PDF um, you know, and how it's all constructed. So I summarize a lot of this information right here under PDF structure. So you can see the way I look at it is uh, the PDF really broken up into three components. Um, this is very similar to how the functions were broken up in the exe files that we analyzed in class. Uh, so uh, PDF has um, 
you know, a single piece of beginning data that uh, is always at the beginning of a PDF file, and it always has to be this uh, header data. And then after that, you have the main the main content or the main um, you know the the content that's actually under control of the author. So when I make a PDF or when I make a Word document and I save it to a PDF, I'm really editing the part that's here that I've got highlighted. And then after that, after all the objects have been put into the PDF, then we have uh, the ending portion or the, you know, the epilogue of the PDF. And that's a, you know, again, it's one copy of information uh, that's at the end, uh, and it provides, uh, this is a, a table of uh, hints to where all the objects live within the file, uh, so that if a uh, uh, embedded system or a program wants to have quick access to the different objects in the file. It can use this to quickly find them in a really big file. Um, and then there's a trailer, and then finally the EOF right here. So, so um, one thing, and I'll get into demoing this, um, but uh, the XREF table. Uh, needs to exist. So right here, um, it doesn't need to be correct, and we'll uh, explore that here in a little bit, um, but it needs to exist. So what we will do is we'll go here to the minimal PDF uh, entry that the that Brennan put together, and um, PDF is a binary format, so it supports binary content, but it contains mostly plain text. And the other thing that's nice about this is it's actually uh, somewhat is very similar to a programming language almost or a markup language like HTML or something like that. Um, so it's very kind of human editable, um, and we'll look at uh, we'll look at this in a little bit more depth right here. So. So the PDF documents right here, and you can see here's the three different components. So this is the beginning of the file or the header of the file. Here's the main body content right here. So this one has four objects defined. So one, two, three, four. And then finally the tail or the, um, the epilogue of the PDF. So <coughs> The other thing that's uh, useful here, and I need to set the background um, to a lighter color so you can read what's in this stream right here. So the other thing that's nice here is that um, this happens to be written in English, so what the, the text content that's going to be uh, present in the PDF is actually here in, um, in ASCII, so it's uh, viewable by me, right? So if I want to open this up, so you can use any PDF reader. Um, I happen to have this one installed. You can use whichever one you want. So here's, a, here's the PDF contents. So uh, as you can see, this is slightly different. Um, if you looked at it, if you already went through the exercise of uh, pulling down Brendan's PDF, um, this one's slightly different because I've made some edits to it. Um, and I'll demo those to you. So, uh, so you know, one example I could do is uh, I could change the font here. So I just change the base font to uh, mono space, um, or I can change it back to Times Roman, right? So inside of this object, that's the 3 object, uh, I basically looked for the word font, and it's got it all listed in here. So, so that's an example of me going and hand editing the file. So uh, how this file is set up is that um, down here at the bottom, when it first opens the file, it's looking for um, a dictionary inside of the trailer to tell it um, how many, um, or to tell it where to find the um, 
you know the root node so the way that a pdf file is designed is there's a, a tree structure that's involved very similar to your parent child uh, tree relationships uh, if uh, in um, you know in programming and so that's kind of the concept we'll use is that the document itself the pdf is a, um, a container that contains a bunch of objects that are linked to each other or interrelated in a tree structure so as i said um, this right here says that it's referencing the um, the object one zero so every single object in a pdf has uh, two uh, two components to its numeric id right here and almost all the time you'll find that the first one is the not is the only one that's really used and the second one's almost always zero so what i can do is i can actually look for one space zero and you can see it only shows up twice here so the trailer tells the pdf viewer that the object labeled one space zero which is up here at the top right that's the root node and so when it's starting to render, it's going to start rendering there. So inside of that object, uh, it says that the pages are defined in object 2O. And you can see that object 2O actually shows up three times in this document. So you have um, the root object is saying that object 2O is where the pages are defined. And then object 2O is actually the pages object so it says type right here type pages that's the object type definition it says that there's one page and then it describes where the uh, content gets laid out on the page so then the um, page also has or the pages also have what it says are kids or children nodes. So in this case, there's only one of them and it's the three O object. So I can look for three space O. And so then I go down to the next object, right? So the only place that it's referenced is right here. And this has a back reference saying that the previous object that we just looked at was the parent object. And so this object starts talking about how the contents should be laid out and formatted so the first thing it does is it goes and de defines uh, what font to present it in. Um, and then after that, it describes where to go to find the contents. So after you've, or after the object um, contents have established what fonts need to be loaded and all that stuff, uh, then it says, uh, go down to this 4O object and I'll highlight that as well just to complete this. Uh, go down to this 4O object right here to get the actual content that then you're going to lay out using the font that's defined and then it's going to be placed inside of the media box up here that is in the page uh, that then is going to be displayed inside of the document window so that's kind of how that tree structure works and in this case it's a very linear tree so it's very um, you know there's one branch between um, there's one branch from any one node to another node and it's very linear um, <clears throat> but when you get a more complicated document it's not so linear so as you can see I was able to edit the uh, base font and so I'll change that again and then you can see that I've changed it to have the um, to use the Helvetica font again so back to where we started I can also change the contents here if I want. Right? So you can see that um, all those changes are being reflected in the uh, document presentation. So one of the key uh, things to keep uh, to keep in mind is that uh, this object four, the fourth object here, um, has all of this content here that I'm modifying and it defines a length right here. Um, I'm not changing the length when I change this content here, 
but as you and I are all aware, um, the content's still changing, or the content length is changing, regardless of what I'm doing to the length value up here. Um, that's a very important characteristic to keep in mind for PDF documents. Um, the, most of the PDF readers, this one included, um, Acrobat is notorious for this, um, will oftentimes try to um, have a fail safe in place for a lot of these inconsistencies that may show up in documents. Um, you see a lot of documents that are um, that are generated are often created by automated systems or embedded systems where they might have all of this content hard coded in memory bank somewhere, right? Uh, and then the you know the other stuff down here. And then they're just modifying this little bit of data right here to put a table that describes, say, the machine status or a printer test page or something in it. So because of that, um, there's oftentimes a lot of inconsistencies that get introduced with all of the variables that come into play there. Um, so all the PDF readers, all the software authors have figured out that, um, you know, for instance, in this case, um, this length is provided. Um, but if they also keep tra track of a separate length here uh, and they determine that there's a greater length set of data inside of this stream right here, um, then they may just choose to go with that and ignore the length up here altogether. Uh, likewise, the other thing, uh, and this is kind of harkens back to what I mentioned uh, when I was going through the lecture notes, um, the other thing that we have is this cross-reference table here. So every single one of these uh, items here is supposed to tell us which position, which byte position within the file uh, you can find each one of the objects. So this should be referencing the first object, this should be referencing the second object, and so forth. The goal here being that if, uh, say, a printer receives this whole file, uh, then uh, it's told where in the possibly 90 megabytes of data it should go to generate and uh, analyze each one of the objects. Uh, this is another example of something where it's very easy to identify when the object position that's right here, so this one's 78, uh, it's very easy to identify when the object position there uh, doesn't match the actual contents of the document because if I end up going to a position where the cursor is right now, and I don't have a number followed by a space followed by a number followed by OBJ, that means that the cross-reference table is incorrect. So that's another common uh, feature that you'll see, um, especially in malware. Both of these things are the types of things you'll see in malware is um, the length may not match up with the actual length of the stream. The cross-reference table may have a lot of erroneous uh, object references in it. So they may be pointing to wrong locations within the file. Acrobat Reader is designed to identify when, say, the cross-reference is incorrect or the length field is incorrect. Um, or even, for instance, if I put a font in here, like not a font, right? If I put a not a font in here, you can see that it doesn't give me an error. It doesn't refuse to show the file. It automatically picks a different font, um, maybe a default font that exists within, um, you know, within Acrobat um, that it'll show instead. And so then I can change this back to Times Roman and you'll see it'll go back to Times Roman font. Um, but it doesn't refuse to display it because that font doesn't exist or anything. It has a bunch of fail safes in there. So these types of fail safes can sometimes lead to uh, situations where a parsing and analysis tool, um, especially like a validation parser or something like that, uh, may not be able to identify a malicious file very well. Um, but um, Acrobat will continue along and adjust itself to behave trusting that the contents in the documents are meant to be displayed. So a lot of this is driven by uh, usability and everything, um, but also uh, it adds a large number of other variables that need to be taken into consideration when writing secure software and therefore um, pose a large amount of um, exposure risk uh, that can be exploited by the attacker. 
so you know finally here's the here's the x reference so if i go and i set this to like all zeros you can see that the file and i'll even just reload it just to show you it doesn't care um it'll be fine with all of these being zeros see so it figures it out it figures out that uh you know this object's supposed to be here uh, and everything so likewise um i can move um i can move the content around if i want so here's a really good example where if i want to move this over by 50 um or up i can't remember which one which one's yeah move it over so the first number is going to be the horizontal uh, i can move it to the right by 50 um, by just changing that number there um, that tells it um, so what i'm doing here is i'm telling it um, what position uh, within the what's called the bounding box or what position within the um, media box it's supposed to be um, it's supposed to be uh, rendering it so you can think of it like um, you know like my window is on my screen and up here is the you know maybe the zero zero point or down here is the zero zero point of my window um, but that's not the zero zero point of the entire screen that's all the way over here uh, PDF has the same concept where there's a page coordinate system and then you tell it what boxes to lay out very similar to say a presentation tool like PowerPoint or something like that um, and then it'll lay out the text box right here and then I tell it within that text box is there going to be some additional offsets or something so I can move the uh, I can move the media box around here if I want so I can say you know if I want to move it up I'm going to subtract some additional values from it yeah see it actually got smaller so I'm actually changing the size of the uh, um, of the page right here so I'm moving that around so see so now if I do that now I have an entire page and I can scroll down and I can see the hello C right here so so handout in the PDF can be very helpful in trying to understand uh, what's going on uh, what components are responsible for what visual attributes uh, and then later on when you start getting into uh, the more programmatic content so the more active contents within it uh, you may actually have access to say uh, JavaScript or other uh, command code within the PDF that you can modify um, so it's just helpful to explore it like this and hopefully uh, this also demystifies a little bit of the file format and gives an idea of what the structure should be so that when you're exploring the different objects and the different entities uh, you understand better how to navigate the file format and uh, move forward the investigation.